Hello and welcome. Now, before we get started today, I wanted to give you a quick note up front that in this episode, I talk with Vic and Mike from VZR, and we we end up talking a lot about their VZR Model 1 headset, which is for audiophiles and gamers. And so this episode, at times it may, I don't know, I, when I was doing the interview, I kind of felt like it started sounding like an infomercial. But I want to be very clear that uh, VZR is not a sponsor of this show, and this I was not paid for this episode or anything. I just uh, invited them on because they're they're doing something that's new and pretty cool. So we had a fun chat, so enjoy. All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Podcast Engineering Show. My name is Chris Curran. I produce podcasts for companies and select business authors. I also run Podcast Engineering School. I teach people how to produce podcasts at the highest professional level. And on this show, we bring you podcast production techniques on a silver platter. We really talk shop with podcast producers, engineers, and other specialists like today. Um, so, And if you implement the best of what you learn here on this show, your podcast will sound a lot better and you'll spend less time producing them. So today's episode is going to be awesome. Vic the dude is here. That's, I mean, we could probably end it right. We, well, I guess we, you need to talk a little bit, Vic, but I mean, if people who know you, that's all they need to know. So Vic <laughs> right. Tiscarino, happy to have you here, man. Uh, and Mike Hanin is here as well. So welcome, guys. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so Vic, you are Apple's former lead audio engineer, and, uh, and you both, uh, I guess the main thing, well, not the main thing, but the first thing we might want to talk about is that you both uh, are working on this VZR Model 1, which is a headset designed for audio files and gamers. And uh, so we're going to talk about that first. But uh, Vic, you have so much experience in audio. Uh, Mark Levinson Audio, um, you worked there and you worked on many projects with Apple you were hired directly by Steve Jobs. You have 20 patents in audio and acoustic design. Uh, you've designed amps, mics, and vacuum tube gear. And, and so happy to have you here. Um, I definitely, I'm going to ask you, after I introduce Mike, I'll, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask both of you actually about your histories and just, you know, explain how you got here, uh, your whole sort of career roadmap. So Happy to have you here, Vic. And Mike Hanin is here, too. You're a co-founder of VZR, which is awesome. And you've worked as a sound designer and a supervisor for some of the biggest video games. Uh, game audio is one of your specialties, the spatial sound, which I wrote a, I wrote a blog post about that game. Uh, oh, I can't remember the game now. Among Us. That's the game I'm talking Among about. Among Us. Oh, okay. Got it. Yeah. 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 My daughter plays that with her friends. Yeah. So anyway, I wrote a post about Among Us because when the characters moved across the screen, the sound would go from the, your right ear to the left ear. It was like pretty cool. And it, and mm -hmm. there's so many different players. Anyway, uh, you're also a uh, co-host of the Audiophile Gamer podcast. We'll link to all this in the show notes, by the way. But everyone should check out the Audiophile Gamer podcast, which you co-host with Sir mix -a -Lot. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on. That's so cool. So I'm so glad to have you guys here. Uh, Vic, why don't you just real quick, take us through your career, where you started. And, and I kind of gave some highlights, but uh, would love to know more of your background. Yeah, well, it just uh, started off doing uh, radio design, communication products. And uh, one of my hobbies was audio. And we started an audio company building uh, high-end audio gear, vacuum tube amps, regular transistor amps. Uh, speakers, accessories for all the high-end audio type things that you, you could use in your system at home. And uh, we grew the business and in about 2000, Mark Levinson, who had already had a couple, uh, two successful companies, uh, one uh, Mark Levinson Audio still, you can see that trademark in uh, Lexus automobiles on the car radio stuff. But uh, in any event, that's the same Mark Levinson. Uh, we started an audio company as 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 one of the co-founders and uh it was based out of new york we manufactured in redmond washington and uh, several of the senior management at at apple including uh steve 
uh, liked our product. He actually used it in his uh, in his system at home. And uh, one thing led to the other, I'll just say. And in 2004, he recruited me to come down and, and, and give him a hand uh, launching their audio their audio business. Uh, mm. uh, they wanted to do it a different, you know, they had a lot of people that were very skilled in audio there, but uh, they wanted somebody to throw a little bit more of the high-end kind of um, mystique on it. And I actually built their first uh, consumer electronics uh, lab. They didn't, uh, most people, depending on what uh, they were doing at Apple, would work at their desk, maybe in a large room. It wasn't very sophisticated. Uh, I think the most sophisticated lab was they had an anechoic chamber so they could measure the fan noise on CPUs uh, to get those quieter and quieter. If you remember, the PCs used to roar with their fans. Mm. They still do in some cases. But uh, Apple was about trying to get rid of fans, and they were trying to get lower and lower speed fans for that. So that was a sophistication at Apple. And uh, and uh, so I stayed there for about uh, seven years and uh, kind of semi-retired and launched uh, VZR with Mike. Nice. So and that, VZR? That bring... Give us the overview of VZR. Okay. Well, VZR uh, is an interesting... Uh, it, it actually does not mean anything. Mm. <laughs> so VZR is, a, is just a couple of great initials here. Uh, so what we set off to do was improve the playback especially of 3d audio as you know that's an emerging technology now it's been around for about 20 years and uh, as software uh, we've had binaural recordings for many 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 years and i don't know if anybody knows what binaural recordings are it's a dummy head recording you know it's a dummy head with microphones in each ear and that's the analog of what's going on and that's been uh, translated in uh, into software and they use the head-related transfer function. That's the directional sounds coming to each ear and the timing of those, along with filtering and frequency. That kind of tricks your brain into thinking you're hearing sounds all the way around. And with headphones now being 80% of how audio is consumed, headphones are very, very popular. And I, you know, I dare say for a minute, um, I don't know if anybody will believe me, but you know, Apple really brought headphones back. Uh, Sony Walkman. You know, was a little foam ear pads, yep. and uh, kind of died down. And the iPod brought it back and made he- listening to headphones pretty cool. I, you know, it's uh, totally. So, so the, I'll, I'll uh, pass it over to Mike here. But I think that brings us up right up to to what we're doing here with VZR. Uh, and and Mike, I'll, I'll 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 give you some space here. Yeah. So Mike Kaneen and. Uh, you know, Vic and I actually met because we have common interests in uh, spatial audio. So I began my career in, uh, and I'll get to the VCR question and why we sure. exist. But as far as like the history of my background and how we sort of converged together and, and decided to work together was uh, I've always had an interest in audio ever since I was a little kid. You know, my, I'm a son of immigrants and my father played violin and uh, played in an Arabic music ensemble. He used to teach violin. Uh, and when they emigrated, my parents uh, emigrated to the United States, he uh, didn't really utilize his music, uh, sadly, uh, professionally, and made his career in other things, uh, non-music related. So, uh, But he loved music when they would always play music. And so I sort of grew up with a, a love of uh, semi-audiophile equipment, like my dad had uh, transistor-based uh you know, Marantz, like, uh, you know, uh, receivers and amplifiers and tape decks at first, a reel to reel system, and then went to tape decks mm. from like uh, the cassette tapes, uh, from Akai. And I used to always play around with his stuff, <laughs> you know, and erase over recordings and things <laughs> like that to their chagrin. Um, and, uh, so I used to love recording and figured out, you know, signal to noise, you know, just by just messing around like, Oh, Hey, there's, you know, um, there's a way to deal deal with noise and noise reduction, things like that. Fast forward, um, you know, I uh, pursued audio production uh, as a career, and uh, you know, studied it at a school called Full Sail uh, in nice. Orlando. Went back to uh, what city where I'm from, which is Los Angeles. So I went to Florida to study, came back, 
And, uh, you know, the nice thing about LA is there's a lot of studios there. Um, at the time it was, you know, if you wanted to work in audio business, you basically had to go work at a studio somewhere And some of the studios in LA or some, you know, one of the world's finest. I got pretty lucky and ended up, um, interning at, uh, Hans Zimmer's production studio, um, where they do uh, music production at some of the biggest movies out there. I was just a fly on the wall. I wasn't like a big shot or anything, but that's where I sort of learned the craft, if you will, and got to witness, you know, these amazingly talented, not just music, uh, you know, um, composition, but also, you know, the orchestras playing, you know, we, I remember, you know, going to the Sony, uh, uh, scoring stages and hearing, you know, the music for as good as it gets being recorded. Uh, Alan Meyerson, who was the scoring engineer, uh, recording all that, uh, using a Deca tree, by the way, of like, you know, Neumann U47s in a, in a Deca tree. Hmm. It was incredible. And so where I sort of fit in in that world was I was assisting Hans Zimmer's music editor, a guy named Adam Smalley. And so I was, this, we're talking about mid to late 90s. That's where things were transitioning to the digital realm in terms of editing. So Pro Tools, the early days of Pro Tools was around that time. And Adam had a, a Pro Tools system, Pro Tools 3 system. Anyway, so that's kind of how I started. Um, fast forward after sort of, you know, working in the film industry for a few years, um, I there was I worked on a game project uh, for a tra- it was a trailer actually. So one of the sound designers that was working with Hans at the time uh, was doing the sound design for a trailer for Medal of Honor Allied Assault. Claude Latessier was his name, so I, I helped him on that project doing the sound design on that, and that blew my mind because it was I was starting to see wow these these games are now starting to actually use you know, not only film score, um, you know, scoring like uh, you would a film in terms of orchestral. And I think it was Michael Giacchino was the uh, composer on that. Um, and Claude doing sound design. And this was a trailer for their for that game. And I was just blown away. I mean, it was basically a recreation of the Saving Private Ryan storming the beaches of Normandy and basically creating a uh, a replication of that using, you know, in an animated 3D animation version of that. Nice. as a trailer for that game. And that's when I realized, wait a minute, I should start looking into the game industry. Now, one thing I forgot to mention was I grew up playing Atari. You know, the 2600 mm. and Pong actually was the first game. I, so you could tell by my grays here, you know, I've been around, uh, you know, the early gaming system. So, you know, and then really the gaming system that I was drawn to is really the, the, the one where I spent a lot of time on was the Commodore 64. Um, and so I spent a lot of time in the Commodore 64 and then went to, you know, Nintendo and then PCs. So I've always had gaming in my blood. I loved audio and getting into the gaming industry, I was able to sort of merge those two together. So I worked for a studio called THQ and, uh, we did, uh, Pixar's, uh, cars, the game version of the Pixar cars movie. Nice. And, uh, a couple of motocross games and, uh, that had like, you know, I got to go record like, you know, uh, you know, motocross and uh, ATVs and monster trucks, actually. And then for cars, we got to record everything from, you know, Porsches for Sally's character and then Lightning McQueen. We actually recorded a NASCAR. So that my job was to actually go and, you know, mic up all those engines. You know, we did them on dynos. It's, it's a whole bunch of stuff we did. Anyway, Very cool. in the back of my mind, as I'm working on this stuff, I'm realizing that interactive audio was really uh, of interest to me. As sounds are work in a video game, you have a game and all the different objects in the game move around and the game engine keeps track of that. And so I started realizing, wait a minute, there's potential here for doing some really cool spatial audio. Uh, and you know, as Vic mentioned, HRTFs, and they were starting to be used in, in PC games at the time. There was some um, technologies on you know OpenAL, there was uh, other technologies out there that, you know, um, Sound Blaster, I'm sorry, Creative Labs was doing with Sound Blaster, EAX, and things like that. We're starting to do spatialized audio. I had an interest in that and wanted it to be even more prolific. So I actually ended up working for a company that was a potential vendor for Apple. And that's how Vic and I met mm. because of that common interest in spatial audio. Nice. And so that's all the background you bring to, to VZR. Mm-hmm. And now you've mm-hmm. created this... Model one. So let's 
let's start from the beginning. Why why did you guys even create the Model One? Like like what 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 actual problems were you trying to solve? Well, I I've been building a headphones for quite some time and speakers I, I don't know if you recognize this i know people may not be able to see this but the ubiquitous uh earbuds apple earbuds well myself and uh two other team members uh have our fingerprints all over these babies and literally hundreds of millions of these things were created they were the pack in but they sold them for like 30 bucks and there's so they've sold a lot of those things and while they may be kind of low to the ground you know to some people uh, these had to have a reliability and uh, at least a certain performance level. And, you know, right. we can say that they're matched and acoustically they worked okay. And, you know, reliability of the wiring and whatever. So that's how I started. But, but you know, as far as the mass production of things, what I've always noticed in one of my f- first high, I, I purchased every single high-end headphone back in about 2010 that I get my hands on. I had one of the first Sennheiser HD 800s. Uh, I had to wait like 90 days for those things. Hmm. I bought every Foster, uh, Fostex, every Grado headphone, Stacks, the top of the line Stacks headset. Uh, I at the time that were, they were the creme de la creme. As a matter of fact, I think the HD 800s were the most expensive, and I think they were fifteen or sixteen hundred bucks, which is in two thousand eight or whenever they were delivered was pretty was a lot of money. It's a lot of money now. It's yeah. it was a lot more then due to inflation. So what I always found, and I don't know how anybody else feels about this, but I, I know that when I put on headphones, for the most part. The expectations were these are headphones, okay? So the sound is in your head. Uh, it's stuck to my head. I don't get any sound stage. What I got from better headphones was the treble was a little bit better, a little bit smoother, a little bit more engaging, a little bit more detail, but the sound was stuck in my head. Uh, and, and I, you know, I hear audiophiles talk, wow, well, God, this has a little bit more sounds. Well, I think what you're hearing is a little bit more detail, and so you're hearing further into the room. You hear a little bit more echo reverb a little bit more space of the room and uh, a lot of people are going to open back and you know i hate to say it but you're starting off with with open back and i have some Uh, you're starting off with a noise floor before you even hit the play button right if you don't play anything you can hear the room so there's some pro and con to that and with close back the issue is reflections as the speaker's trying to play into the enclosure people hear that as a resonance so there's all these things going on that I don't suspend disbelief that I'm wearing headphones. Um, with 3D audio, I'll see if I could present this using visual. We've all seen a hologram. I've gone to Disneyland. It's probably my first experience. I've been 10, 12 years old. We saw the hologram down with mirrors and whatever. But if you step to the side, one way or to the other, left or right the hologram collapses, right. right? Well, guess what happens with stereo speakers? You can, you, you, there are some really great speakers. I've designed, uh, I, I would say I have a, a pretty good holographic system, vacuum tube based. I'll send you pictures of it if you like, you kind of see what I have. Sure. And uh, I, it, it sounds pretty good. But the best spot is the sweet spot. You don't have to be locked into a vice, but the sweet spot. Once you step off of that, the hologram disappears. Right. Okay. So, one key advantage you have with headphones is you've got these enclosures over your ear. They are like little rooms. They, you, so it's kind of like being, they're kind of vice to your head, kind of like the sweet spot of the stereo. But these are not moving as long as you don't move the headphones around. So we have some control. And the one thing about 3D audio is, is that you can position, object-based the audio where you can position things in space using software binaural audio it's it's all there it's baked into the music it's an analog and you're going to hear basically what's recorded in front of it as if you were sitting there but with software there's some cool things we could do with the with the engineering and that is that for games they can record gunfire and position those in space and put it around you behind you walk behind you know uh, people walking by airplanes above you can simulate that with headphones. Much more difficult with speakers. Uh, Dolby Atmos right now is doing some interesting things, but they've got to deliver the sound to each speaker. And again, using software and blending, it's 
I hate to say it, it's never going to be a perfect thing because it's in a room. There's a lot of things going on in every system. I'm sure there's an optimum system somewhere, but in the average home, that's going to be harder to replicate the optimum system. With totally. headphones, you can do a pretty cool thing. Um, yeah. So what we did is I, I listened to it. And I wasn't really happy with any of the headphones. I, they all sounded good. Don't get me wrong. You know, they, they there's obviously some very expensive headphones, but I, I never got the belief that I was right there. And if you had, if you look from a top-down view, if you can imagine the sound stage that you're getting with 3D audio, it was almost an ellipse. Okay, it's not a sphere around your head above and below you and, and front and back. Right. And part of the reason is is because the driver or the speaker that's sitting right next to your ear, it's a half an inch away, it's just blasting into your ear. Your ear, outer ear is still functioning. It's not functioning as if you didn't have headphones on, but it's still there. Right. It's not in your ear canal. It's, it's sitting away. So that last 13 millimeters or half an inch is where things break down. Hmm. Uh, so we developed and patented a product we call Crosswave that I'll, I'll simply say is a, it has many things going on at the same time, but I would say it's controlled dispersion of the output of the driver. We can control the sound launching off the driver. Um, so by doing that... So basically... That, when your when your headphones when the VZR Model One the the little speakers on each side fire sound into the ear, each one that you're processing the sound a little bit to avoid that to to basically negate that 13 millimeter gap that you're talking about. Is that true? To, to agree, I, I've okay. I've got a model here, so just just for for show and tell. But I know people can't see it, but you can look at your your friend's ear next time you see them. If you take a look at the ear canal and you measure the space here, that's more than an inch. And the sounds arriving at the ear bounce around in that little bit of delay, roughly about 50 microseconds. We Our, our brain is really good at wow. figuring this stuff out, okay? But, but that's how it works. I mean, if you think about it, your brain has figured out all these little delays and filtering along, along the pinna of the ear. Right. So, plus, it's figured out the shape of your head. I mean, it, you don't think about it. It's a human experience. But, you know, the ear pinna, the sounds coming from the back, is shadowed. Okay. Yes. It has to go around. And we've just figured out over time where those sounds are coming from. And a lot of what we hear is we have a huge library of our memory is everything for hearing because we, 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 we it, oh, let's just use, you know what a trumpet sounds like live, right? Or a violin live, whichever. Right. We've all heard live acoustics. And when we're listening to stuff, you can say, well, it, it represents, but I'm not, it doesn't really tell me that it's the real thing, right? So, so we, we, our brain knows and tells us that we got this big library of sounds and, um, I'll give you another yeah. example. You could be, you could be in, uh, Thailand. Okay. And never been to this restaurant. And all of a sudden somebody in the kitchen, which you don't even know where that's located, drops a, a bin of utensils. Right. You could almost tell if they're using metal utensils, which utensils hit the ground because Pulling it from your memory. Oh, that's what a spoon sounds like. That's what a fork sounds like. Knife, right. whatever. So that's how, you know, part of our listening experience is pulling back memory and what you're hearing at the moment and where it's coming from. Yeah, the and audio, the way our brains perceive audio is, and, and I think this is sort of what you're getting at, it's so complex and it's so precise that when we try to just slap some headphones together and try to reproduce 3D audio, like, our brain knows it's not real. And so what you guys have done is you're trying to get it more as real as it possibly can be. Is that is that correct? Yeah, that's we're basically trying to get to the whatever optimum is, okay? Right. Uh and and uh, I I we've presented these to several professional engineers um who you know, they're playing with their headsets and when they say says, you know, these sound like I'm listening to speakers in the room, not wearing headphones. Mm. So depending on the content, now some content doesn't display, it doesn't have the right phasing or whatever. It's just sound coming in. Right. I mean, you can look to some early 60s recordings uh, when they were experimenting with recording techniques. Right. And 
you know, it's just sound left and right, ping pong stereo. But yes, this these are we're trying to to uh, give a more human experience, and you'd have to try them to understand what that is. But it's pretty cool. I was gonna say, Mike, when you first put when you were you know developing this with Vic, and like you, I guess you tried a bunch of headphones and a bunch of things, and like what ha- like one day you just put on what you guys were making, and it just sounded way better, and you're like, oh man, this is it, dude. Is that how it happened? Basically, I mean, that's. I mean, look, we we spent a long time. Pardon me, I'm going to mute for just a sec. I got yeah, yeah. Something take your time. Throat. One sec. No, no, no. Take your time. I can easily edit this out. You can. That's start great your about asking. It, 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 what's great about asking uh, Mike if you can hear me? What's great is I'm so close Testing, to one, two. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Oh, okay, good. What's 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 cool is is that by asking Mike because he saw this whole thing develop and literally I I I almost brought a picture of all the headsets that we went through as we uh. progressed with the design because there's more to it than that there's you still have the same things you have to work on to develop a headset like frequency response the target curve and 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 all that things that make it sound good but we have some controls with this patent that gives us the ability to do some EQ along with other things, but uh, not not to get too deep in that because we, we're we're not even uh, we're, we're uh, you, you know we're you and I are looking at each other on a visual here, but uh, and I could show you some graphs and things. For, but that's yeah, not be for helpful. your clarification, Chris, I want to show you something just real fast because I know your viewers might not see this, but just so you understand, what we're talking about here is not a. Uh, did you see that? Yes. Okay, this is not a a. a uh, software uh, solution that we're talking about here. This is literally a physical plastic, if you will, uh, device that's placed directly in front of the driver. And it has these sort of apertures that are pushing sound in different locations to the ear. So the shapes, the geometry affects not just uh, you know frequencies, but also affects timing, which is critical. So and this is actually on our website, so people can look. Uh, on our website, we have a diagram of the crosswave, what we call the acoustic lens. So it's a bit like a filter that affects sound coming off the driver and pushing into different parts of the uh, ear, as Vic was pointing out, like your pinna, you know, your, mm. your outer ear. So this just for your benefit, as so you can see it, and you can kind of get an understand, and maybe viewers can see on our website. Yeah, the, yeah, the, I, I can get that, that picture, and you yeah. can mention that. I'll get the picture, put it in the post. Yeah. And then as far as like, you know, uh, the whole process. So <clears throat> we, one, one thing I learned from Vic and Vic is, uh, you know, not only my business partner, but my mentor as someone who is, you know, uh, has decades of experience more than me on the, not to date you Vic, but <laughs> 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 the, uh, yeah, he has a lot more <clears throat> experience on the, um, I mean, I have prediction, uh, sorry, experience on the production side, what I don't have is actually building audio gear. Um, so it was kind of neat to sort of get a crash course over the past few years, decades of, of uh, experience, uh, 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 you know, decades of Vic's brain, if you will, being poured into this product. Right. Learned and learned a lot. So in a nutshell, one thing I learned from Vic is you got to know what good is. You need to have a reference. Right. And, you know, here's the crazy thing, Chris, and I'm curious to see what you think about this, because, you know, as an audio engineer, you know that, <clears throat> you know, when we're mixing, when we're doing production or whatever, um, you know, we kind of have to refer to some kind of reference. Right. Uh, we have reference microphones. We have reference speakers. We have <clears throat> our own reference systems, but then also maybe even by memory or experience, like working in bigger studios, <clears throat> understanding what those setups are like. And Vic brings that to the table with this. And so first off for us, we wanted to go learn, uh, and he kind of mentioned all these other high-end headphones, kind of get a sense, what is good? What is considered a good headphone? What makes a good headphone? <clears throat> and understanding how they work. Um, and so looking at everything from dynamic drivers to electrostatic to planar magnetics, you know, we've been to some of these conferences for headphones like CanJam. Uh, and put on $50,000 headphone systems. I oh, kid man. you not, there are $50,000 headphone <laughs> systems. Uh, Sennheiser makes one. 
uh, uh, Hi-Fi, Hi-Fi Man. Man. Yeah. Hi-Fi Man makes one. Do you just like action. merge with Divinity while you're listening or something? Man. Well, you'd be surprised. You'd be, you, you realize, <laughs> you know what you're paying for at that point? You're, you're paying for uh, an incredible vacuum tube based, you know, amplifier and DAC system in combination with some really great uh, acoustically, you know, brilliantly designed uh, headsets. And yeah, you get a sense of, wow, there's a sheen, there's a polish to this, but it doesn't, it, it's not like perfection, just so you know. Right, right. It's right. like, it's still, I mean, you still feel like you're wearing a headphone. Anyway, right, right, right. We, we, we went on this quest to understand what is good headphone sound. And Vic sort of went into the lab, right? He went into his bat cave mm-hmm. for a few years and was like, you know, kind of un- trying to understand the problem from different ways of view. And one thing about him is that, you know, he thinks outside the box. He's very unconventional sometimes with some of the things that he does. And so I think with a crosswave solution, because here's the thing, there's nothing quite like it out there. Like no one is really doing what we're doing in this, in this way of putting something in front of the driver to affect the sound before it comes to the ear. Typically you'll see like a grill, Right, and that's just there to protect the driver because people are poking their fingers in there. This right. is not that. This is right. literally has a function that is acoustic in nature. So, you know, again, thinking outside the box and doing this. So, you know, we feel that the culmination of Vic's research and, you know, and, and developing the crosswave technology, but it's not just crosswave. Everything about the headset is critically tuned from the base porting to the type of ear pads we're using. I mean, imagine... Being uh, literally no screw, no stone, if you will, was left unturned, right? Or right. Un, uh, uh, you know, you know, we basically look at everything that makes a headphone, a headphone, and let's examine everything about it. From structural integrity, we got things like carbon fiber that's being used on the ring. To you see this ring here, this black ring on my headset. Yep, <clears throat> that's actually a carbon fiber ring to increase the structural sort of rigidity of the ear cups. Um, you know, these ported, invented ear pads, um, you know, everything from the headband design. I mean, just everything was looked at. Right. Very cool. So have you guys heard of, uh... oh, by the way, what's your website again? So people can go find. Sure. It's VZR audio, VZR audio.com. Okay. So I remember we were talking about, or you guys mentioned binaural a couple of times and, and uh, there's also this uh, Ambio thing mm-hmm. a m b e o which mm-hmm. i think is it from sennheiser i don't know if they developed yes. it or yeah okay and it's where there's like a a mic it's like four microphones on a little ball that are pointing all different directions and that's how you can capture audio from all directions and then that gets translated to like for video games and stuff for for meaning i i think the 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 best part of ambio is that for gaming, when 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 pe- when a person who's playing the game turns their head, the the audio should turn ninety degrees, right? Because whatever was in front of them is now on their right, and so I think the ambio somehow manages to track that. So then, when people do turn their head, it does follow them. Are you familiar with that? So the ambio system is actually uh the microphone system uses a principle called ambisonics so what ambisonics is a uh the ability to capture a 3d sound field using a microphone array and so what the ambio is doing is using what's called a first order uh um, you know b format microphone a format that captures and, and you're able to convert to b format but essentially what it is is using those four mics to recreate a 360 degree sound field and you're right the cool thing about ambisonics is it's uh, rotatable so you can actually rotate the sound field so if you have a head tracker on the headset then you know the sound field can can rotate right so um yeah so there are <clears throat> there's binaural there's ambisonics and what's called object-based audio Right, which is basically a mono sound that's uh, spatialized and moved around in a, and you know to simulate a sound moving around you know around you in in um, in real life. So it's a combination of those things. There's a few different formats out there. For example, Dolby Atmos has their own sort of HRTF based uh, object based audio reproduction. Um, Sony has a system. Right, that uh, they use for not just music, but on the P- PS5 for video games. What's cool is our headset actually can plug into any of those. 
So if you're playing a game that has, amb- uh, I'm sorry, uh, has, let's say, Adobe Atmos, right? It's powered by Adobe Atmos, like a game like Overwatch. Or if you have a PC that, and you're playing um, Call of Duty Modern Warfare, or I'm sorry, a Call of Duty Warzone. Warzone allows you to select to use Windows built-in 3D audio system, which is called Windows Sonic, or you can purchase the 15 bucks, pay the 15 bucks in the Windows Store and use Dolby Atmos. And regardless, that's all happening upstream. Our headset allows you to, you know, basically hear that in the best possible way. Right. Um, and so whether it's Ambisonics, whether it's, you know, uh, a he- you know, a binaural, you know, if you're listening to, let's say, a track that's recorded binaural, like, you know, Chesky Records, which is uh, David Chesky, he records a lot of stuff in binaural. Even in YouTube, you can go on YouTube and see some, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, I don't know, like uh, tr- jazz trios or whatever, a number of different, you know, even classical music and, you know, classical mm. ensembles, they record in binaural using a dummy head, and you can hear that on our heads, and it sounds incredible. Mm. I mean, you get a 3D effect regardless of what headphone you're using, but uh, with ours, it kind of preserves... Because of what we're doing with the crosswave, it's it, it it just sounds more realistic and it's more there, there right? Right. Um, so yeah, yeah that makes so, sense. Uh, one question I had, I've always had yeah. this with three D audio or spatial audio. I've like because I've tried it a few times and like left to right and front. Well, what, what should I say? Left to right, it's easy to hear the differences, obviously. Yes. Absolutely. He- but heavy like, pants. Yeah. But front to back is not, it, it's a little harder to hear the difference. And also top to something above me Absolutely. versus something below me. Like, how how do you space, I don't even understand how you would like place something above me. And then when I hear it in my headphones, my brain's going to say, yeah, that's above you. Because in my experience, it can sound like it's above me, but it also, at the same time, can sound like it's below me. Is that a, is that a weird question? No, not at all. You know, okay. Now, this is something maybe not a lot of people say it this way. But, w- okay, so when people refer to HR2... Okay, let's take a dummy head, for example. Right. If you actually take a look at a dummy head recording, uh, or a dummy head, especially the ones from Neumann, or uh, there's other companies out there like... Um, Vic, what is the Gross system and others? You, if you notice the ears that are on there, it's almost like listening with someone else's ears. Right. Think about that for a second. Those ears on the the, the ears on the dummy head aren't your ears. Right. Right. Or even if you're listening to a recording done with microphones put in someone else's ears, you're still listening with someone else's ears, unless those are your mics and your ears. You could. Right. Ambio, I don't know if you know this, one of the things they offer in addition to that four element array is that you can get these headphones that actually have microphones on them and put them in your ear and you can go walk around, let's say a plaza somewhere, whatever, and record that on your iPhone and play it back through your ears and you'll get a really good, super amazing binaural recording because that's your ears. Right. But if I was to play back, play that recording for a friend of mine, it's going to be my ears being represented on someone else's, you know, ears. If right. You so will. it's going to skew the sound sl- exactly. Slightly. Yeah, yeah. So, it's Mike. If I could stop. Yeah, yeah. What, what happens is, is these these algorithms that are being used, or in the case of Van, but is is that it's like ma- the filter set that they use to ma- create the idea that you know a sound coming from here has a different EQ coming to your ear than over here. Right. Uh, it's like make forcing everybody to wear a size 10 shoe as opposed to having the proper shoe size. Right. So, and, and, and so, yeah, some people, the shoe's going to be sloppy, but they get their foot in there. Other people, they're going to fit pretty darn tight. I know they're taking that to an extreme, right. but you get the idea that, that you can get more perfected, uh, filter sets to represent you. I, I didn't send a picture. I almost took it to one of the, uh, where they're scanning me, for a 3D, where it we actually will sit down in the future here. You'll be scanned, and it'll cover. It'll take your whole head and your ears because even your torso makes a difference. I don't know if you know that. Oh, uh-huh. everything about you it's reflecting into your ears. So you mentioned sound above your head. Think about yeah. this: if I have a plane, it's bouncing off of the floor and bouncing to my ears, but also your shoulder 
into your ears. Right. So those little minute reflections uh, from something above your head, that creates a better elevation cue. So that's why there are some uh, of the software representations or HRTFs actually don't just do the ears, but also the head itself and the torso. Uh So you'll find that different solutions have better results like there are some solutions out there chris as you point out they have a better way of like you can actually hear in front of you better as opposed to it sort of being a hole like it goes from left to right and it's like wait a minute i don't really get the sense or what i don't know if you've heard it this is a common thing what's called a front back reversal there are times if you put the sound dead center in front of you it'll sound like it's behind you right because there's still not quite enough information in that digital representation to let you know, is it in front of me or behind me? So one way that people would, or one way to trick that is to use a head tracker. Because just changing your head movement a little bit will be like, oh, that is in front of me. Because oh, that slight right. change, right, will help you. That's why they say to solve the front back reversal, head tracking helps with that. But I have found, and this is through anecdotally, and, and you know, there's evidence for this with studies, that if you get a very good HRTF that has a, um, a good quality HRTF that's closer to your ear shape, right. you can produce that, uh, that front uh, imaging better. And one thing I will say, as someone who's heard a lot of headphones and a lot of HRTFs, um, I found our headset with the VZR Model 1 actually produces a very good sound in front of you, even with normal stereo. Like I'll listen to some classic recordings and really feel like the the vocals sitting in front of me more oh. with our headset than let's say a competing headset. Right. So it's those types of things that I think the you know the Vic is sort of was trying to address. Yeah. When building the VZR Model One. I don't know if I can interject here just for a second, but you know the recording process. Think about this. The typical recording process from an engineer says so some desk, like I'm sitting in front, with speakers about six feet away, equilateral triangle, 30 degrees off, and the engineer sits there and mixes it. He's They're positioning the, the drivers at your ears, kind of wearing them like headphones, but at six feet away. And that's the illusion that they're trying to engineer. Right. I mean, because if you think about most recorded music, Almost all of it, even in an orchestra, they drop micro- several microphones in front of you know from the ceiling down, and some on the floor, and somebody has to kind of make that represent what it would be if you were front and center, right. and and so almost all music is engineered and produced as if somebody was sitting here and they want to create that illusion on stereo speakers in front of you, right. in the car. Does that translate well? It's up to you know you've, we've all heard car audio, so. Uh, so that is different than the way people are hearing music now. They're listening. Eighty percent of the content is heard over headphones, earbuds, whatever. A million headphones are produced every year, so of all different types. Just to throw that little thing mm-hmm. out, can you imagine that? A million headphones of all types are being produced every day. But back to headphones. Oh, every day. Got it. Got it. Wow. Yeah, every day. That's a lot. Of, that's including all these little uh, little guys like yeah, this. Yeah. But that's earbuds a lot of headphones. Where are they where are they going? Right. Yeah. 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 But get to headphones. It's interesting. Uh, Anthony Ray, Sir Mix a Lot. He uh, he's he does a lot of people don't know this, but he does a lot of commercials, uh, little movies, trailers, all kinds of stuff. Uh, now he's doing a lot of engineering. He's got a great s- studio set up, and uh, he was doing everything over these very expensive monitors. I won't we'll go nameless, but very expensive on, on the order of twenty five grand for this pair of smaller monitors okay. uh, with, and he's got a set of, um, uh, I think they're dual 12s on each side, so a stereo pair of subs to represent what he's doing. Right. And uh, he says now he's using these headphones uh, something like 70 to 80% of the time. He's doing almost all his mixing on headphones. He's wow. doing it the way people hear or consuming the music, right. and he goes back to the speakers. It, it was the other way around. I do it on on speakers, put headphones on just to make sure that it translates, and now he's going the other way. He can hear more detail in these headphones, and it represents and does better stereo uh, uh, stereo imaging for him in headphones. Yeah. So, uh, you know, so that's that's an interesting reversal, I think. Yeah, and it speaks to the delivery method of your VZR Model 1 headphones, because that's... That's the advantage uh, that you're claiming with your headphones is that it projects a 
more realistic and more clear audio signal into the ear of the listener. And I think the frequency response is very natural. That's a whole other subject, right? There's a big, con- I won't call what it a controversy. What do you mean by that, natural? So there, there's a, uh, okay, you know what speakers, and Vic, can, he's an expert in this because he's a guy who's measured speakers. You know, there's a way to measure f- speakers and sort of figure out what the flat, what a flat response is. Right. Right. I use that, in a room. Uh, Sonar Works is a company, they sell software right. where you, I have a microphone, I move it around my speakers, it tells me where yes. to move it, and it builds a it builds a profile to negate any deficiencies in my speaker playback, so it flattens out right. the frequency playback. Yeah. Now, so you're basically flattening your room, right? You're right. coming up with a, with a flat frequency response for your room. Doing that for headphones is actually extremely difficult, and it has to do with the fact that the headphone can sit in different ways. Right. around the ears yeah so you, you move got it these... like one centimeter it's co- exactly completely different. <laughs> exactly as vic pointed out those 13 can you imagine all those microseconds of delays and and yeah. you know anyway so and I, you know that's a whole other discussion in of itself but i'm just saying that we have our own frequency response that we thought that vic thought was what he liked right and you know and it's a whole process over you know years and years and years of development but you know and so Harmon has their own uh what they call the Harmon curve we have our own proprietary curve and there are even you know solutions out there like sonarworks actually has a head headphone calibration system that yep, allows you I got to that too yep. basically you know eq for your headphones and so anyway so it's an art it's a science as well um and we bring our own sort of uh as you can tell, like we're we're really into this, right? Yeah. We're not yeah. like this isn't like something, and I mean not to plug and you know this is a bit shameless, but we feel we're bringing this attention to detail to a gaming headset, what we call audiophile gaming. That's why we call it audiophile gaming. This isn't your typical gaming headset where it's like something you find overseas that a company will be like, oh, we're just going to slap a logo on it and make sure the logo's straight and the colors are cool and have RGB lights, and we're going to call this the best gaming headphone. No, we're approaching it the other way around, my friend. We are looking at every little detail that, uh, from a sonic standpoint, from an acoustic standpoint, and that's where our focus is right? as so opposed guys, to the other way around. Yeah, yeah. So for you guys, so, so VR, you know, virtual reality, all these different headsets and stuff, like, Virtual reality requires audio that sounds real. So your your product, not, maybe not even your the 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 Model One headset that you have already, but your technology of how you're getting it into the ear could be used in VR. Absolutely, applications. that's how we started. Yeah, Honestly, actually, actually, I didn't mention that is that we did we we started off doing a, a, a headset, head mounted display. Okay. Mm-hmm. And you know where companies like Oculus are on that. They're still working and they're developing and they're doing. One thing I noticed, though, is the audio playback through the headsets that they were showing with just didn't match the video. Oh, I'll okay. give you a very I'll give you an striking a striking example of that. So you go get an Oculus, uh, either the Rift, Rift S or the, you know, the Quest or the, you know, the Go, right? They have little speakers inside. They're using these special transducers that are actually pushing sound in your ears. But let's say, and I've tried this, you go try one with a t- uh, Tyrannosaurus Rex stomping around you. Right. The low frequency response on that is, like the high frequencies and mids does a good job of actually like delivering that so you get the spatial audio representation. Does a pretty good job at delivering spatial audio. But the low frequency response is almost next to nothing on that. Uh. So... Imagine you're. What's the whole point of VR? That suspension of disbelief. That what they call presence. The immersion. Yeah, the, the immersion. immersion. So you feel like you're there, and your brain is tricked into it. So if you have this big thing, have this big monster or a giant T Rex, and you're not getting any low end from the stomp. Think. You remember Jurassic Park? I mean, the whole point of DTS, right? When it came out, was a. Yeah, you know, so watching the little water, you know, a cup in in the original yep. Jurassic Park. I mean, and that was the whole point of DTS was like this was a, a dedicated subwoofer channel. You can really feel that. Well, if that's gone, then that T Rex experience is gone. Right. Right. So anyway, that's just a striking example of what happens when the audio doesn't match the visual. Right. And in our case, the mid range high frequency response also is something that needs attention. We feel that having a closed back headphone. With VR, that gives you a full range experience from low to highs. 
with the crosswave technology is great for VR too. So you don't necessarily have to use the speakers on the VR headset itself. You can plug in ours and kind of override what they have and get a better experience. Right. So just to clarify, the Model 1s right now are closed back? Yes. Okay. Um, so let me ask you this. What if, if you were to revolutionize your own headset that we're talking about, what would be the next step? Would it be like sticking something in your ear that went right like one micron away from the eardrum or something? Like how can you I get hate it that any feeling? Better? I don't know if you ever had something. In your, I don't like having something in my ear. Yeah, no, no. I honestly don't. I, I can't. I mean, I know people are really into IEMs and, you know, that's their preference, right? Wait, what is that? Um, IEMs? The inner ear monitors. You know, like uh, oh yeah, the custom you know fit. those types of the custom, like custom IEMs head, out there. There's the whole thing. There are people yeah. out there that are really into that, right? And, and I'm not knocking it. I just personally, I don't like having something shoved in my ears. I like I like kind of like having something just kind of circumoral. See, in I fact, never knew I they went into see, your ear that much. I this never goes knew that. way. Mm -hmm. This goes. I don't know if you can you can see on the video like the ear cups go actually way over or the ear pads I should say yeah. are over the ears. It's not actually pushing on my ears in any way. And I have right. I actually have very big ears, <laughs> yep. so it fits very comfortably uh, with this. So, yeah. Well, one of the other things that we've been talking about the the playback of the headphones, but we also the challenge was uh, was the microphone. You know, I I can't hear myself. I can you know as far as wh how I'm coming across. Mike's on his, uh, but we wanted to have something that was uh, very compatible with just about anything this will plug right into the an xbox remote the controller this is right now plugged into you know since it's a podcast you know you can be obviously very sophisticated using software and other external devices i am plugged straight into my macbook pro i'm not using any software this is uh this is on the platform we're uh, recording on now. Right, Riverside, so, which, by Riverside. the way, you're also plugged in with an eighth-inch mini plug right into your yes, correct. computer. Okay. Correct. Got it. And, and so, you know, maybe... What if somebody... Uh -huh. Just a quick question. What if somebody wa had, like, an audio interface with an XLR input? Like, there's no way to get it in there, right? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, I'm, you know, I think there's a way to do it and that's something to be determined. I'm actually, that's what I want to do because I would love to plug this into my DBX 286S, which has an XLR in mono in, yeah. right? Well, I'm so, sure there's a uh, converter. There's like probably a, a converter, yeah, or yeah, a, yeah. you know, impedance and there's probably a few things to consider. Um, or and, just but I'm sure there's a way. A female eighth inch stereo to a And male the wiring XLR. has to be yeah. as such, right? You know? Yeah. yeah. Because there's, there's, this is a, uh, you know, with XLR, it's balanced. And with this, it's unbalanced. So there's got to be a way to do it. And we make yeah. sure the grounding is all right and stuff. But I'm sure there's a way. Yeah. I'm sure just a con uh, I would love like to that. do that because I have a DBX286. So I'm not, you know, I'll, I'll let you know once I <laughs> figure yeah. that out. Yeah. So the mic, so the mics on there are, uh, they sound pretty good. You both are using the headset with the mics. And uh, yes. so obviously it's a dynamic mic, I'm assuming. And is it, is it no no it's it's an electret oh it's an electret condenser yeah okay. yeah electret condenser and yes. it's is it directional sort of point like picking up yeah, well so let me let me take this off nobody will be able to see this but maybe you can describe it so can you see that you yeah see, so we have a we have a patent on on the way this looks yeah. and it's all about the directionality and the frequency response and the shape of this. I don't, again, I don't right. know if you could see. Yeah, it's hard uh, to see the shape, but um, you just took off like the foam windscreen. Yes. Yeah, and there's a little, almost looks like a fingernail, like an extended fingernail. Oh, okay. Where it scoops the sound a little bit. Got so it's it. actually, that, and that's there for a reason. Got it. So that's, you could probably it see it on mine better. Um, uh, oh, wait, hold oh, on. Oh, yeah, yeah, Let yeah. Let me go this way. Do you see that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So it kind of like yeah. takes the uh, takes the sound right from your mouth and scoops it in, ca catching more of it. Yeah, without sounding tinny though. Oh yeah, no, it sounds totally yeah. fine. Yeah, totally it, it, this is a, a, a I'll call it. It's easy to say noise canceling mic, but it's a a, a sound control mic. In other words, it it I could have easily taken this to a true noise canceling mic. In other words, the closest sound I would have to put this right here. Yeah, and. But what I, I didn't want to do, it sounded squeaky, actually, when I did that. I got really good front to back. In other words, sounds at distance, but my voice got really squeaky. Uh -huh. So I, I, we had to balance that between, you know, uh, 
frequency response, the tonality, right. and and sounds outside. Uh, you know, or or you know, you could probably hear maybe the finger snapping a little bit. I don't know. I don't have my well, headphones turned up that loud, actually. Oh, oh, okay, well, it's doing a good job. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, um, the microphone here. I, I, we kind of. Oh yeah. Mentioned so this. this this other mic that you're talking about, you're actually holding it up on the screen right now, but it's it's on the wire. So the the wires that run from the headphones themselves, there's a basically a big bump, a big controller type thing. Yeah, go ahead, Vic. It's a mute yeah. switch too. There's a yeah, mute switch. Yeah, on Yeah, there's it. a mute switch on the back, but this is Omni. And the reason is if you, you know, in, in the event that you lose or break this, which can happen on, on, on any headset, um, you always have this microphone with you because it's part of the cable. So phone you can take phone calls like or whatever. Yeah. Um, and totally. I, I, cool. I, I'll, I'll see if I could show this because it's kind of important. If you're doing it. Oh, yeah. So it automatically switched over. I'm holding yeah. it up right now, but now it's now you can probably hear that, right? Yeah, now it's picking it's up more of the room. Yeah. It's Omni. Uh, it's it, you probably yeah, it's got it about up. four inches from your mouth right now. Yep. Yeah, okay. that's the microphone on the wire. Just so everyone understands. Right, what it's, we're a, it's about mid chest level. Yeah, mid chest and, level. That gets too far away. And, I mean, and, that's, it, and it, it, yeah, that's and rough I, and for any yeah, well, any mic. To, <laughs> well, yeah, and and you'd have to run the gain up, right? So yeah, yeah, so put the gain up. But it automatically switches over. I'm just going to just plug this baby right back. Yeah. And I'm back on on the boom microphone. See, that's cool that you could. I mean, there was obviously a little noise when you hot plugged it, like just took it out and put it in. That's cool that you could just do that, and then it 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 changes the source automatically. That's that's yes. very cool. And uh, one of the other things, one of our one of our investors in the company uh, was, plays Overwatch, and one of the headsets he was using, the mute switch didn't mute all the way. He says, you know. He says, when my wife comes up and talks to me and she says something sometimes in my ear, <laughs> even in the mute, they could still hear. Uh, <laughs> so, so we made sure, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you the mute. It mutes, obviously. <laughs> this is nothing fancy here, guys, but I'll show you. Testing one, two, one, two, I'm back on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so. Yeah, they probably, anyway. his friends probably made fun of him for years over what his <laughs> wife said. <laughs> in his yeah, so he said, make sure that thing mutes. <laughs> cuts off right so we're getting toward the end what what uh what have we not talked about uh i think this has been amazing i'm so happy to go deeper into the technology and i mean it's, it kind of does it, in a way it might sound like one big long infomercial for your product but obviously <laughs> that's not what we're doing and 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 it's just genuine interest on our on our my part and my our listeners part because like you said this is different and this is new and it's not like anything else. So that's sort of why that that's really why I'm talking to you guys. So is there anything we should cover before we sign off? I would just say that uh you know the basic question you started off with is what you know what are we doing how are we doing it and and what was the impetus for the design? And uh, whether it's podcasts or gaming, gaming is like one big long uh, uh, podcast because they got the chat line. And that was the other thing is the audio on those chat lines is pretty, it's terrible. Oh, it's so bad sometimes. It's so <laughs> it's really bad. And I, I don't want to call out anybody, but the point is, is it's really bad. So our challenge was to get something that sounds reasonable on those uh, because the audio is so compressed and so bad and then on top of that if the microphone is squeaky sounding it's even worse and then guys uh overdriving them they they seem to overdrive too easily um uh, i don't know where my microphone is here but it's got uh uh let's see um studio yeah vic designed this uh, mic so that it can handle uh you know some pretty you know obviously it can distort a preamp right if, if depending right. on your levels but it can it can handle very right. loud plosives and things like that pretty well yeah. Nice. Doesn't totally blow the actual element, if that makes sense. Right. Partly because of that design of that that I'll call it the fingernail. <laughs> right. You know, is because it's it's coming to the side. So in other words, it's it's perpendicular to the sound coming out of your ear. Right. Or out of your mouth. So it's not like you're not like just blowing it with air. It's it's off right. to the side, if you will. Yeah. So um, and that cool. ear cup helps collect sound a little bit. So anyway, it, so it doesn't overdrive. It actually holds up pretty well when you're screaming. <laughs> at this thing, yeah. that was the that was the other one, yeah. Because gamers get really loud; they get, start to yell at yeah. their at their friends. I know, hey, the or, guy's gonna get you, or do, or know? do the Leroy Jenkins. I mean, that's the, yeah. the yeah. classic, yeah. right? Exactly, the Leroy. <laughs> 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 Love that. 
I played World of Warcraft. I remember that. Yeah. I don't know any of the games. I'm not a gamer. I've, I've, you know, Mike, you were talking about back in the old days. That that's where I was. We had in television. We had Atari. Mm. In the, whatever late '80s or mid '80s. Even I don't even know when. Um, anyway, I don't really game much anymore. But well, this has been amazing. I will put all the links in the show notes to your website. Yeah, we'll have sure. A picture. We'll have some pictures. We'll have everything there. Um, I, I'm really happy to have you guys on here, and thank you so much for just going deeper, c- kind of taking a look under the hood of all this stuff and understanding 3D audio. So thank you guys so much. Oh, yeah, our pleasure. Thanks for having us. And hey, yeah, Chris, if you have thank any you. questions or anything, let us know. Happy to answer them. Yeah, and just uh, the website again? VZRaudio.com. VZRaudio.com. All right, well, or usually... You just Google I, VZR Model 1. There you go. And so, uh, well, normally at the end of episodes, I play music, and then we we all yell, sound great. But uh, I haven't done that in a, in a little while. <laughs> um, I'm trying to make my show... I don't know. Sometimes when I get a little crazy, it's like... It, it the show doesn't sound like I don't know I I don't like the way I sound and you know you know when you always listen to your own voice you, you hate the way it sounds oh I'm the same way no I think you sound fine Chris I, listen, I, I think no, it's just something old, everybody has old episodes where I'm like you know getting all amped up and it's like oh my god shut up it's, it's horrible. <laughs> but anyway all right let's leave it there thank you Mike thank you Vic thank you it's been great we'll see you guys thank you again.